It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 333 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 26th of May, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And Joe Benamou. Hello, everyone. And a quick reminder for everyone, go to scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in some love and keep the show going. So let's begin. And Penny, look, I don't know a lot about sex. I've heard it's very fun. But <laughs> one thing... I do know is that most of the time, it's really awkward if your mother gets involved. <laughs> Unless you're Tasmanian, of course. Ooh, do. Or Mike Pence. But it's a bit different with bonobos, our primate cousins living in the Congo Basin in Central Africa. They have a, well, a very different societal attitude towards sex. And the mothers are quite controlling and involved in helping their sons find a mate. How does this all work? Yeah, this is an interesting one. So the, one of the observations that kicked off this study was that um, there was, you know, a young male was trying to mate with um, a female and this other male, a higher ranked male, came in and, you know, tried to interfere and come between them. But then the young male's mum came and chased away the other bloke, letting her son <laughs> finish off his encounter. So at first, you know, we, the researcher didn't really know what was happening, but when they realised it was mother and son, it added an extra dimension to this. And it's actually kind of surprising because what's sort of understood about female apes is often they'll stop unwanted males from mating with themselves, but they don't generally interfere with other couples. So it's interesting that it is mums repeatedly sort of interfering with their sons. They don't tend to do this for their daughters. Daughters in bonobo societies tend to move away, but sons tend to stay with their mums. And it seems to be that males, even in a good, with good odds, it's not a given that a male bonobo will reproduce. Like obviously some of them do, but the way that their society works, not every male is going to have offspring. Um, so without his mum around, the chances of one having a kid is about one in 14, which mm. is pretty small. Um, if they still live with their mum, they're three times more likely to have their own children than ones whose mums have gone. And it seems to be that, you know, we've got this statistic and we've also got a mechanism of mums interfering. So, um, yeah, so... One of the ways could just be that, you know, if a male is sticking around near his mum and women, um, female bonobos tend to be quite high ranking, then he's more likely to come into contact with other females and so on, right? Um, but, yeah, there's also this active interference. They'll stop unrelated males from mating with other females. They'll gang up with their sons to get other males to go away and so on. And it's interesting because this behavior doesn't seem to happen with chimps. So chimps are another close relative of ours, but they live in more patriarchal kind of societies. Um, in their societies, all adult, adult males, adult right rank, all females. So a mum's influence might not be that much. But because um, bonobo females tend to have a lot of contact with their sons and perhaps even some status over sons, or over other males, then, um, yeah, it seems like it's really helpful. So it could be, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one. Penny, do they, um, so I know you mentioned that they um, they will interfere to sort of um, keep other males mm. away. Yeah. But do they, do they also in influence the females that are chosen by the males or? I don't know if it's to that extent. I, I didn't see anything about picking particular females but more just, I guess, like increasing chances of any female from what I can tell. Yeah. This is really interesting. And obviously, as you say, there's a, a statistical importance to it because and mm. that's something that they've developed evolutionary, I guess. Uh, they just yeah. society has recognized that that is an important thing and it's just something that they've passed on. It's very cool. Mm. Okay. 
Joe, let's move on and talk about lung cancer, which is actually sometimes quite tricky for a radiologist to diagnose in the early stages. You might see a shadow or a lump and not necessarily know if it's a tumour or just a nodule that's harmless. There's always the chance of a false positive or a misdiagnosis. And that's where artificial intelligence might come in. A huge test using Google's AI computers found that the algorithms performed better than human radiologists in determining whether patients had cancer and also had fewer false positives. So this is an interesting step. Do you think this heralds a new era with a new and improved Dr. Google? It certainly does. And, you know, we're seeing this kind of uh, use of AI um, starting to appear in a lot of areas of diagnostic medicine. Uh, But in fact, um, I'll speak to that a little bit more um, once I explain this particular um, area. But um, uh, as you say, what's what's very interesting in radiology is that uh, it can be very challenging for radiologists to to recognise um, certain features on the scans that they're looking at. Uh, and as you say, lung cancer can be uh, you know one of the particularly challenging areas. Um, now, with this uh, this form of um, AI that's been developed by Google, they use something called uh, convolutional neural networks. Now, in no way will I uh, pretend to have any real understanding <laughs> of this, but essentially, uh, as I understand it, uh, the, the types of technology that can be used to identify uh, patterns or sort of, you know, essentially pattern recognition uh, used in AI, uh, there's a, there's a a different type of uh, neural network which can be used, which looks broadly uh, uses pattern recognition. So it'll uh, it'll look at things like particular shapes and so on that are common to certain. Um, uh, for example, uh, there was an interesting one that I saw uh, used for this particular um, article, which was looking at an image of a swan, and it would break down what a typical swan would look like, uh, with say you know a, an orange beak and sort of a rectangular shape in the neck and so on. And it it shows how um, identifying these types of features as common to particular objects is what allows um, AI to learn and then uh, recognize uh, consistently uh, what these these things are. Uh, but that one of the challenges is that this can vary depending on where uh, where objects are in an image and uh, it, it can it can be quite difficult to actually get them to learn some of these these patterns. Now, um, what can be what's very interesting about lung cancer uh, or identifying anything within the lung is that, you know, when when we're looking at, for example, CT scans, the sorts of the size of the thing of the of the uh, the areas that we could be looking at can be quite minute. And it used to be looking at sort of old X-rays and so on that we were looking at sort of much uh, gross features on scans. But as technology has improved, what we can actually see on a CT scan is becoming clearer and clearer and we're able to take smaller slices within a CT scan. Uh, So, for example, if you're looking at a a CT scan that takes five millimeter slices, but let's say the object you're looking at on the scan is only two millimeters, with repeated scans, you're not necessarily 100% certain whether what you're looking at falls within the margin of error for the uh, the size of the slice that's being taken. And when we look at patients, not just with lung cancer, but with any, any types of cancers which may have metastasized to the lungs, or we're looking at changes in the lungs that may be because of uh, medicines or, or any other um, anything else that could affect the lung tissue, this being able to identify these tiny little nodules can be incredibly difficult. So my understanding is that this this new type of AI is able to recognize these patterns and features in the way the tissue looks on CT scans in a way that is far, well, not just superior, but, but far more accurate to the way radiologists are able to do this. As you said, one of the challenges around diagnosing lung cancer is that with any screening test, there's always the risk of false positives and false negatives. And false positives can lead to harm. So, for example, in prostate cancer, if you have a patient who has a false positive for prostate cancer, they then would go on to have certain tests to diagnose whether there is a prostate, whether there is a cancer there. So, they may have a biopsy. Those biopsies are, you know, while they can be beneficial, they also can cause harm, such as infection or bleeding and so on. And the same risks apply with lung cancer screening. So if we're sending, you know, thousands of patients off who are uh, potentially at risk of lung cancer to have these screening tests and 
you know, they, they come up with false positives, then there's the risk of harm from any subsequent tests that may be needed to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, there's also the risk of missing a diagnosis. And there's also the cost to the healthcare system from all of these tests that are then triggered by these, uh, these screening tests. So it would be hugely beneficial to be able to use this kind of technology to more accurately diagnose lung cancer. Now, w what I find very interesting is, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, the ethical uh, side of, of AI in medicine. And, uh, you know, as, as exciting as it is to have this kind of technology available to us, there are a lot of ethical issues that are uh, now coming up in response to this technology. So, um, you know, first of all, there is the, the risk of misdiagnosis, which you know, of course, there's that risk with, with humans as well. But the problem is how well the technology has been validated. So, you know, it's very easy to get very excited about new technology, but the people using that technology need to be really confident that it actually does what it's claimed to do. And, you know, we've seen in the last, you know, 10 years or so, as there's been this kind of boom in, uh, you know, in health technology, a lot of claims made about what some of this can do. And often at the other end, we find that, you know, not not all the claims turn out to be quite as exciting as uh, as they seem to be. Well, um, on that, how much better did these algorithms perform than humans? I mean, it was only something like a 5% higher detection rate uh, or something? That's right. They said that, that it detected 5% more cancers and cut false positives by 11%. Okay. So, and now, it's impressive, that, but it's not. insignificant. Yeah. But they say that it performed on par with the radiologist. So it, the difference actually lay in the number of scans that were available to them. So one of the, you know, one of the important things about uh, one of the important aspects of radiology is being able to compare scans. And, and you know, I've actually seen this a lot in in my work, where patients who are undergoing treatment uh, on clinical trials. Or, you know, or, or just generally patients who are undergoing treatment for cancer will have a, a, a scan done to look at their response to the treatment. And, uh, you know, those scans are, are usually, you know, done within a, 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 a sort of stand, fairly standardized time frame. From a single scan, you can often, you know, we'll often see reports from radiologists which say, you know, there's an indeterminate area on the scan or there's a, you know, there's a new lesion of, un, you know, of uncertain significance. And what we often don't know is whether some of these changes might be related to the treatment itself because, for example, uh, as immunotherapy is increasingly being used in, um, in the treatment of cancer, it, um, you know, it causes a certain or it can potentially cause certain side effects in the lungs, such as pneumonitis, which is a which is inflammation of the lungs, uh, and and other other changes that are due to the treatment itself. And sometimes it can be quite challenging to determine whether those changes, when they are so small, when they when we're talking about you know changes to you know. Uh, two millimeter changes, it can be very difficult to know what is actually causing that and whether it is cancer. But being able to compare those scans from one time to the next is very important in making that distinction. Mm. So what they found here uh, in, in this study, uh, it, was, uh, it was superior to the radiologists when looking at a single scan, but it performed on par with the radiologists when prior images were included in the evaluation. And that, that's not too surprising because of the, of the fact that looking at a single scan is quite difficult. But if there are certain patterns that the, that the AI is able to identify um, that the radiologists perhaps are not as practiced at, uh, identifying that it would make sense that they may perform better. One of the things that was pointed out um, in the uh, in the article um, about this study was that, you know, in a lot of places, for example, in America, you will have general radiologists who are reading these scans as opposed to uh, specialist thoracic radiologists. And uh, you know, in any in any area of medicine. You know, I, I, I've I've mentioned this before that you know medicine has become so super specialized that you really require a level of expertise that is uh, is quite challenging to to um, saturate your population with. So it would be very difficult to have enough radiologists to have that thoracic that specialist thoracic knowledge to be able to provide these services across the board. Uh, so I would imagine 
that yes, if you can use this AI to to make up for the fact that you don't have that everywhere, then then it would be very beneficial. Right. Okay. But but in terms of the in terms of the ethical aspects of mm. using this kind of AI, you know, there there are concerns around consistency of the quality of the data. Uh, we don't yet know about um, you know how. Uh, efficacious it is uh, clinically. Uh, and one, one of the issues when we look at this kind of AI in the clinical setting, not so much in terms of, uh, you know, reading a scan, but more in terms of things like, um, I think it's IBM. Yeah, IBM uh, have developed this uh, this technology called Dr. Watson, which reads through thousands of, uh, essentially reads uh, the evidence and, and, and spits out a recommendation for the best treatment option for a patient. The challenge of that kind of technology is that it doesn't take into account patient preference and, and what we might know about a particular patient. So a doctor making a recommendation for a patient would know, uh, you know, if, they, if they're able to engage with that patient about what that patient's values and preferences are, uh, the AI can't take that into account and the AI may make a recommendation that, that really doesn't match up with what that patient would want in their life, whether it's more time on this earth or better quality of life. So there's lo a lot to sort of think about as we start using this technology mm. and planning uh, sort of where it would be appropriate and where, it, where there are... Um, where there are areas where it may not be the best thing to use. I think from, from those that point of view, it sounds more like there are ethical issues with how the technology would be used and not the technology itself. I mean, this is sounds like a potentially very good diagnostic tool in saying, mm -hmm. yes, you have a cancer or something, but any decisions made thereon yes. should be made by the doctor in consultation with the patient. Absolutely, but that's not necessarily going to be the case and uh, sort of, in, that, sorry, that's not necessarily going to be the case everywhere in terms of how people choose to roll it out. So, for example, you may have situations where, um, you know, some hospitals may require that, th that this technology is used and not all doctors will necessarily want to use the technology. Uh, you know, it can, it can potentially have an effect on doctor-patient relationships. So, for example, um, you know, patients will want to know how, uh, might want to know how their their uh, diagnosis has been made, and if doctors can't communicate that well to patients, patients may feel sort of uncertain about relying on this new technology. Particularly if you tell them that we sent your data off to Google. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and this is one of the key areas here is about you know when we when we choose to use any sort of new technology like this, there's a huge trust aspect mm. involved, and we already know that that the, you know, people generally do not feel a great sense of trust towards tech companies. You know, you look at how Facebook has used people's data um, and Google and so on. So if these, if these large tech companies are starting to sort of, you know, start stepping into the health sphere, um, you know, they, they need to establish trust um, in the, you know, in the patient populations that they're actually getting involved in. Yeah, of course. Um, but I still think the technology itself is impressive and obviously it will need more trials to be and better looked at how it can be integrated into the health system, if at all. But I think it's certainly encouraging that technology is improving this rapidly and getting this good, that it's often better than humans. Absolutely. It's very exciting technology. And I think that, you know, this aspect of, um, of AI in healthcare could, could make a huge difference in terms of the issue of false positives and false negatives. Um, you know, the, the burden on the healthcare system from, you know, the, the, these types of diagnostic errors are tremendous. So it, uh, it would, you know, it would prevent harms, hopefully, if it, if it turns out to be as effective as, um, as it seems to be at the moment. But that remains to be seen. Yeah. Okay, Lucas, let's have a climate change story, shall we? Because climate change is real and humans are causing it and we really, really, really need to do something about it. If someone could tell the current federal government, that would be great. Now, fortunately... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Moving on. Moving on. Moving on. Fortunately, though, it does seem that the trees may be already doing their part as a new study has found that as atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have increased, so has the amount of carbon dioxide being absorbed by plants increased. But that's not enough and it's not going to last long, is it? No. Um, 
and as you say, the the plants have kind of gone. Oh, for God's sake, humans! <laughs> do I have to do everything? Serious, do I have to do? And not only are you cutting us down, now we're going to have to pick up the slack and 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 you know photosynthesize more. I um, made so- oxygen for you people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th- this is not uh, new information in and of itself. The original study was actually back in 2017. Uh, It was a study led by Elliot Campbell, who's at the University of California. Um, They did a study back then which showed that photosynthesis had increased uh, uh, globally on average around 31% compared to what it was before the Industrial Revolution. So it was interesting that the, the increase in photosynthesis and the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere around them kind of tracked along with the the atmospheric increase at about a quarter of the pace. So okay. basically they're, they've picked up some slack, but not all of the slack. So I, when I was reading this story, what's actually changed and what's new here is that another study has been done based on that 2017 data, which was, which in itself was very interesting because they compared that to Antarctic um, uh, ice cores, uh, looking at the the levels of um, uh, 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 something called uh, carbonyl sulfide in the atmosphere. Um, they used that particular chemical because it was a good analog for carbon dioxide. The problem with carbon dioxide and trying to track its pathway through plants through their various cycles is that it it does come back out again, right? So um, trees will photosynthesize during the day. They'll convert uh, nutrients and carbon dioxide to sugars, which they use to uh, grow more stuff, (laughs) get bigger (laughs) leaves, um, get higher, all that sort of stuff. So uh, and also they, they put that, uh, that, that, uh, those sugars and energy into their root systems. Um, they even share it, funnily enough, which I didn't, didn't actually consider until I read the story. They do share these, um, uh, you know, the, the, the carbon that they collect with uh, mycor- mycorrhizal fungi, which are like little tendrils of fungus that, that sort of have a symbiotic relationship with the trees uh, on their root systems. So... You know, it, it, there, there's quite a, a lot involved in the process. Um, and then, of course, at night, when trees respire, they breathe just like you and I. They basically put it back in, they put you know, some, some amount of carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere or carbon back in the atmosphere. So for that reason, they, the original study, uh, um, uh, people chose to look at this, this other carbon or sulfide instead because – that gets absorbed as a similar rate to carbon dioxide, even though there's a way less of it in the atmosphere. It's, it, it does track along at a similar rate, um, but it does get broken down by processes inside the leaf. So it doesn't go back again. So they were able to use it because it wasn't going back in to say, okay, how much is actually being absorbed? So that was really all their original study looked at was how much was being absorbed. They couldn't really tell you tell how much was going back in. Um, this new study has use their data, but they've constructed um, computer models uh, to further analyze and and give us insights into the, the data that was collected. And and what they've shown is that, funnily enough, the, the carbon dioxide levels um, have had an impact in the uh, tropical zones, which is which has been quite directly impacting on the size of their leaves. So in tropical zones, they get bigger leaves, more leaf area, which which basically is like solar panel area, right? You bigger your leaves, the more photosynthesis you can do. But in that wasn't true necessarily in the temperate zones. So in the temperate zones, rather than just getting bigger leaves, the trees uh, or the, the the plants were were also having much longer growing cycles. So they had bigger leaves, but they also had longer growing cycles. But they felt that that effect was actually more to do with the temperature increases on average in those areas, of course, global warming. So on average, temperatures getting hotter um, is, is having more of an impact on, on the, the trees in the temperate zones than, than just, the, uh, just the carbon dioxide. So the new information is that it appears that they worldwide have been doing this, picking up uh, the slack, if you like, but it also 
looks like it might start slowing down very, very soon. And the concern there, of course, is that this may have had a further delaying effect on the increase in temperatures. Now, if you go back to you know other stories that we've done and heaps of the coverage that's on uh, you know climate change over the last decade, we've already seen some sinks which have had a, a, a slowing effect on global warming, one of which, of course, is the oceans. So uh, the oceans have had a, a, a slowing effect on, on two counts. Um, most importantly is the temperature. Um, so the, the global increase in temperature has been absorbed a great deal by the oceans, which, of course, has, um, has slowed things down, but it also means the oceans are uh, basically have taken all they can take. And now what we're starting to see as a result of that, of course, is really big storms and blah, 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 because it's all heat and moisture that drives all that. So uh, the oceans have had a, you know, have, have taken pretty much all they can take. The trees are pretty much going, uh, there's not much more we can do for you. Um, so these slowing effects, if you compare it against the, uh, even the, the most um, uh, optimistic IPCC um, have I got enough P's there? I have got enough C's there. I think so. <laughs> International. Yes. Yeah, that one. Panel um, climate change. Yes. So, uh, uh, but uh, yeah. So it's not not only is it um, as the have the ocean slow things down. Not only have the trees slow things down, but if you compare that against even the most optimistic estimates, where we're sitting in front of those, where actually things are worse off than those, which means you got to wonder how much things are going to catch up really, really fast, mm. right? Mm. If these effects start to be removed from the equation, if they're slowing down, these, these things that are putting the brakes on climate change start to be removed from the equation, it, it could be yet another one of these feedback loops that uh, we're about to see kick in. And that's freaking scary. It is. Um, and you were talking about how their absorption is they're absorbing more but it's only at about 25 percent of the rate that we're producing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere there's yeah a, there's a great quote so, from carl zimmer in there where he describes it is it's a bit like hearing that your chemotherapy is slowing the growth of your tumor by 25 percent yeah which is it's like a I've scary way tumor, to look at it so that'll yeah. be good um but but the interesting thing is even though they're they're only keep like they're absorbing 20 25 percent of the extra co2 that we're pumping the atmosphere their capacity to absorb mm. is continuing to increase as we pump more in but it's tracking it around that 25 percent constantly which is really bizarre um i, I just thought that was really bizarre it's, it seems like an odd an odd kind of correlation there but yeah they're going to reach a point they feel that uh that that this will no longer be the case. And it's going to be due to things like, for example, um, there, there, there might be some limits on leaf size as a percentage of, of what it may have been in the past to, to what they're getting to now. So they might kind of reach their, their limit there. It might also um, be because they can't, um, because the, the rate of respiration may increase at a, a similar rate as the the uh, photosynthesis, which means they might end up pumping just as much back into the atmosphere. There's a whole lot of you know complex chemistry stuff going on in there, but um, it's not it's to mention still my... deforestation and the fact oh, that we're well, cutting absolutely. down trees. Absolutely, I mean this is of course. I, I was I was about to say now that now that we've got Yair Bolsonaro threatening to basically yeah. clear the Amazon, because yeah. what did it ever do for us? <laughs> oh, man. So look, yeah. uh, I don't, I don't want to end the show on a on a negative note, but yeah, it's it's my takeaway from this story was, oh god, <laughs> yeah, holy crap, <laughs> this ain't good. No, I hear. But fortunately, Penny's got some archaeology and hallucinogens to boost our spirits now. Yeah, perhaps, around. <laughs> oh. perhaps we need to, uh, <laughs> yeah, to try anyway. some of that. So okay, mm. well. Penny, do you want to tell us about this small pouch, which was made from fox snouts, which I find interesting in itself. <laughs> well. <laughs> which, <laughs> not that interesting. Uh, but that contains what may be the earliest evidence of the use of ayahuasca, the hallucinogenic plant preparation, and a bunch of other psychoactive drugs as well, wasn't it? Yeah, like quite the assortment. So it was found in a, um, a burial and it's been identified as a ritual bundle given what it contains and what it's made of. It does, you know, it does seem to be a special kind of object. 
And it does. It contained um, snuffing tablets, so things that are used to kind of pulverize the plants into like a powder that you can sniff, a tube for smoking. Um, and the bag is about a thousand years old. So presumably the stuff inside it is of that era. So there was um, minute amounts of different compounds were detected. So there's cocaine, um, benzolegonine, benzolegonine. I don't really know how to pronounce these. That's a, one of the metabolites of cocaine, harmine, bufotenin, DMT, and psilocin or psilocin, which comes from mushrooms. Um, and these came from at least three different plant species. So which what seems to reasonable to me, it's thought that this pouch belonged to maybe a shaman. So, you know, a man or a woman who was able to use these psychoactive plants to, you know, enter an altered state of consciousness and during that connect with, you know, supernatural beings or ancestors or so on. So like you said, like it's got um, harmine and DMT, which are the primary ingredients of ayahuasca. Is that how you say it? Yep. Ayahuasca. 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 Yeah, which is a beverage that is used, you know, to induce hallucinations and altered states of consciousness. So it seems like it could have been an indication that this beverage or something like it has been around for at least a thousand years. Um, you know, either this combination of plants, either through a beverage or maybe, you know, through a kind of a snuff, getting the kind of. Um, same effects so I think that's really interesting I think um you know as far as I know most human societies have somewhere or another of going into an altered state of consciousness whether it's you know ethanol or you know psychoactive compounds in plants like this or even you know I know like you know doing particular dances and spinning and so on like we we do like to play with our consciousness and change it and have those different kinds of experience. Um, what's also really interesting, though, um, is that it does give you an idea of the level of botanical knowledge in the society because none of the plants were really local ones of where they were found. So there must have been um, some pretty extensive and elaborate trade networks and people and mm -hmm. lots and lots of people who knew about these plants and, you know, knew which ones to get and knew who to trade them to and how to combine them and what they were for. So, yeah, I, I just, I just think this is interesting. I love these little snapshots of human lives. I mean, yeah. as we've said before, often what you find is just people's rubbish or their burials with things that were special to them. And, yeah, I like to think about, you know, what it might have been like when, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm not going to lie, I enjoy a good altered state of consciousness myself, probably with less <laughs> meaning to it, but still, <laughs> at times, as Lucas said, it's quite appealing to think that. Particularly you, these days. Be in a different world. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and so this was uh, found in the in Bolivia. In, yes. Uh, the, uh, I've lost the, the name of it, but uh, the now dry Sora River Valley, uh, mm. which is pretty cool because it's one of those things where you just get this, as you say, it's a little snapshot of life. Yeah. And, and we can't necessarily gain a lot from this particular pouch in terms of what level was the shaman held in a society. Like presumably yeah, if he got a, a, a nice enough burial, he was presumably well highly regarded and all that sort of a thing. So, But, yeah, it's just kind of cool to have that glimpse yeah. and like i said a pouch made of fox snouts fox three snouts. of them stitched together that's impressive <laughs> and i think that's our show and as always all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 333 don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in and help us make the show thank you penny lucas and joe thanks Ed. thanks Ed. Thank and thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. It was a week, a week and a half ago now, so I figure you all know that SpaceX launched the first Falcon, was it a 9, uh, rocket mm -hmm. with 60 Starlink satellites. Eventually, they hope to get 12,000 satellites in low Earth orbit and provide high-speed internet to every corner of the globe. 
right after the launch, the satellites deployed. This is what a Georgia astronomer caught on uh, video. Those are the those are the satellites. Now they won't they're they're not yet fully deployed, so they won't be all in a line like that. But if you have twelve thousand objects that bright in the sky, astronomers are very concerned. They they will only be visible at sun sunrise right. and sunset. Oh, so this is right. this is the sun uh, yes. bouncing. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. And and that makes sense. And he's already said uh, Musk has already said that they're gonna the rest of them they're gonna coat with something non reflective oh. to reduce the reflective. Maybe like you know maybe the stealth they'll have stealth satellites by then. But it's only when it catches the sun, right? So in the yeah, middle of the night, black. you'll be able to see stars, no problem. It would more than double the number. I think it triples the number of uh, satellites in orbit around the Earth. And uh, the Kessler... There are 2,000 satellites currently in, in orbit. So... It's going to be six times. Six times more. Yes. There'll be 14,000 all And that is one concern yes. is the clutter, just the sheer volume. Well, that's of, where the Kessler syndrome is a cause for concern. There's an astronomer back in the 70s who said... And, and there have been a number of science fiction novels based on this. If you were to have a collision and, and they would create more space debris, uh, at some point you'd start having a lot of collisions. You'd have a kind of mm -hmm. exponential increase in the number of collisions. And pretty soon there would, the entire sphere would be, a, you know, would be su surrounded by space debris to the degree that the planet would die. And if it didn't, the bigger problem would be you could no longer send anything into space. Yeah. Because something would hit it. Yeah. Remember so, the scene in Wally? It's just like that. <laughs>